Hi everyone, I'm Celeste. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm here just to catch you up on how I'm doing with my March movie-thon. It's a tag I came up with called Cinemarch and I'm hoping you'll join along as well. So far, um, Ashley, the untrained librarian who has her own fantastic channel, um, is en enthusiastically joining in and I really appreciate that. So thank you, Ashley. So check out her channel. I'll post it down below for you and um, so I'm just here to tell you about how I'm doing with Cinemarch so far and also to uh, share with you some other great books that I'm reading in March so here we go without any further ado um, I have been having such a blast with Cinemarch that I don't even know if I can contain it within a tag for one month I think from now on, I'm just going to be basically learning about the movies and watching lots of fantastic movies and reading about the lives of, um, you know, actors, actresses, producers, directors, the backstories, read the books that the movies are based on. It's just fascinating to me. I'm having such a wonderful time. I've been reading all about the silent movies and um, watched some Mary Pickford, which was available right here on YouTube. YouTube. And then in addition to that, I picked up this book at the library because one of the challenges in the tag is to um, read something about the movies, like behind the scenes or about a director or an actor, etc. So I picked up this book called Conversations with the Great Movie Makers of Hollywood's Golden Age at the American Film Institute. And this is um, George Stevens Jr. and he's the editor. Look at this. It's a bit of a, a behemoth. I don't know, does this qualify for mammoths? Um, not sure, but anyway. Um, so I've been having a great time reading about um, various directors. There's tons of interviews uh, in here and I specifically, specifically um, chose the Golden Age. There are other volumes in this series. But uh, just check out some of these names. Harold Lloyd, King Vidor, Fritz Lang, Frank Capra, Howard Hawks, um, William Wyler, George Stevens, Alfred Hitchcock, George Cukor, Billy Wilder, John Huston, Elia Kazan, David Lean, it goes on and so, on. So, um, and then I'm looking forward to the next volume of this as well, which um, focuses on other directors that I'm really interested in, like Otto Preminger, Joseph Mankiewicz. Um, and so, starting out with Alfred Hitchcock in particular, I know um, in terms of feminism, he's not always looked at in a super positive light, but if you're just viewing his films and his genius there, um, it's a fascinating story. I do have another book that I've ordered, A Year of Hitchcock, and it's basically um, watching a Hitchcock movie once every week and learning about his entire oof. And um, his interview in here is fascinating. So that's going really well. And of course, I did watch Rebecca, um, which was directed by Hitchcock. Loved it. Um, I know I've seen it before a long time ago, but it was so great to revisit it. And Joan Fontaine's performance is mwah, wonderful. Um, and then moving on, um, I also watched here on YouTube again, um, a film noir um, called Whirlpool. And it was kind of a strange movie, but um, it starred Jean Tierney. And I loved Jean Tierney, um, her performance in this, and have gotten really interested in Jean Tierney. And so I'm going off on kind of a Jean Tierney tangent. And uh, one of the things that I did get was Self Portrait, which is Jean Tierney's um, autobiography that was co written with Mickey Herskovitz. And this, right from the first paragraph, is gripping. Um, the first chapter is called The View Below. And um, she's basically standing on the ledge of her New York City apartment uh, building about to jump. 
and she's looking out across the street at Marilyn Monroe's apartment and um, she's just numb, not feeling anything, obviously clinically depressed. And um, I, you know, I find her story captivating because she was such a beauty and was seen to have so many advantages and yet um, she had been forced to give up uh, her daughter who had been born with special needs and um, she had several failed marriages. She had relationships with Howard Hughes, John F. Kennedy, Prince Ali Khan. She received shock therapy in a mental hospital in the 1950s and talks about that. Um, so this is not a story of pure white privilege. Um, she went through a lot and um, I, I really feel for her and I'm really captivated by this autobiography. And then in connection with that, um, I'm also reading Agatha Christie's The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side. And um, this is one of my Collins Crime Classics um, facsimile editions. Yeah, uh, so this the premise of this is that Marina Gregg is a famous film actress and she buys Gossington Hall along with her latest husband, director Jason Rudd. And Dolly Bantry, Jane's friend, has moved into the little sort of gardening um, shack. Um, I wouldn't call it a shack, it's a, a cottage. And um, uh, somebody dies at a um, party that is thrown at Gossington Hall and Jane Marple tries to solve the mystery. And um, the story uh, actually has very many parallels to um, Jean Tierney's life story and the story of having a child um, that had special needs. Um, the same situation occurred with Marina Gregg. Marina Gregg was undoubtedly based upon, in some ways, Jean Tierney. And so um, it's interesting as a parallel to read the two in tandem. And um, I'll keep you posted on this one, but I'm really super enjoying it this time around. It's great. I've also been um, getting into a bit of women's history. And um, I confess that um, although I've read quite a bit of history and I have some books on women's history, I haven't read anything really recent. So I got this um, and this is called Citizen She by Carol Stephen, The Global Campaign for Women's Voting Rights. And this is sort of a graphic novel. Um, I'll just read you what it says on the back here. An inspiring story of women's struggles and victories, Citizen She highlights the global fight for women's voting rights. What does it mean to have a vote and why did women have to fight so hard to get one? Um, so it's this is um, what I would term a mid-grade history. Uh, so it's, I, it was put in the teen section, but it's pretty basic. So I would term it more of a mid-grade, but um, it's very colorful. Um, I read it in one sitting and um, it is definitely for a young audience. But if you don't know much about women's history and you'd like to learn about various uh, personalities throughout history, this is a great one to um, put on your bedside table. So there's figures such as Olympe de Gouges from 1748 to 1793, France, and um, she lived around the time of the French Revolution. So it tells about her. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst in Great Britain. There's a little illustration of her. So it just goes through and gives you like a page and a half um, biography of lots of different female figures who were fighting for rights. Here's Huda Sharawi, 1879 to 1947, Egypt. And uh, here's a picture of her. Um, and then after all of the little bios, 
Um, the next thing it goes into is it's sort of a timeline of when each country in the world uh, where when women got the right to vote. For example, in the United States, we talk about 1920 um, is when women got the right to vote here in the States. But um, it was reserved for white women, so black women did not get the right to vote until 1965, which blows my mind because that is within my lifetime. Um, so incredible, um, horrible, but incredible. And I think this is a great sort of general book for girls of all ages because um, um, here in the states where I live, I live in the home of, uh, not in the home of uh, specifically, but in the town um, of Susan B. Anthony, who is huge in the women's uh, suffrage movement and getting women the right to vote. So when you grow up in New York State, you're thinking of our area here as being the home of suffragism and women getting the right to vote. But really, it's a worldwide issue. Women have been struggling for their own rights and to get the vote everywhere. And uh, so I think it's important when we talk about women fighting to get the vote that we see that as a worldwide issue. You may want to learn the history of your own country uh, and the, the women who figured in the battle specifically there. But remember, it is a worldwide struggle and it's still going on. Um, and so this is just a really uh, not light, but uh, easy to finish in one sitting uh, kind of bird's eye view of feminism across the world done in a graphic novel form. So it was really neat and I've been enjoying it. Citizen She. So next, um, I've also been sort of dipping into books which are part of March fashion. Um, I'm on kind of a theme uh, with world war and fashion and women's lives and what women were doing and what they were wearing, um, what sort of roles they were playing in the world wars. And so um, another book that I picked up, which is phenomenal, is Lucy Adlington's Great War Fashion Tales from the History Wardrobe. Is this not a gorgeous, gorgeous cover? Um, yeah, I'm loving this. And here's what's on the back here. And for those of you who don't know, Lucy Adlington is a novelist and also a fashion historian. And sometimes she combines those two interests together in the books that she writes. She's the author of The Dressmaker of Auschwitz. Um, and she talks about women in the resistance women on the home front and this particular book is all about fashion and um, so it's a great snapshot of social history and what women were wearing in the early 1900s into the 1920s first of all look at the end pages here um, it's all made up of fashion ads so i think that's marvelous and then the entire book is just gorgeous it's lavishly illustrated there's tons and tons of photographs for example here's a chapter on hair and hats and it's called crowning glory lovely 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 talks about hairpins and hats and the use of real plumes um, from birds and um, cruelty to animals actually and how they stopped that practice and women living in tenements who actually made hats for the very rich women who wore them. Um, it talks of course about the Great War and women's roles in that and um, wearing bloomers, wearing pants, um, what you would wear at home. Um, it talks about um, evening wear and it talks about um, under things and uh, what you would wear if you were playing golf. So as women's roles were changing, um, the clothing did as well, of course. Um, and so she's looking at um, a huge variety of resources, posters, sewing patterns, fashion magazines, 
photographs and uh, more. Here is something that interests me greatly. Um, this is about um, a tunic that was worn by a sister in the Red Cross. So if you're looking for a lavishly uh, illustrated, wonderful, um, rich history of women's fashion in the World War I or Great War period, I definitely recommend Great War Fashion by Lucy Adlington. And then sort of to go along with that, um, it's not specifically about fashion, but I picked this up. It's a $30 book and I picked it up at Savers for $5.99. And it is uh, Women at War, the women of World War II at home, at work, and on the home front. So again, in honor of uh, Women's History Month and also because I just love learning about the social history and roles of women in the World Wars uh, and the interwar period as well. Um, this is another fantastic general overview for those who may not know a lot about women in World War II and it seems to me like a super starting place because it gives sort of a, a general overview of women in all different roles. Um, you know, everything from working on the home front and uh, joining the waves. There's a, a poster there, a recruitment poster. And for those who don't know, um, the waves are the Navy women accepted for voluntary emergency service, and that was in the Navy. Um, and then there's the wax, uh, the wasps. Um, there is uh, the women who were prisoners of war. So for example, this goes into um, a little bit of detail about who the women were at Tanko. And Tanko, um, which was also a BBC's series, I believe, um, which I'd like to see again, actually. Um, they were women that were captured and put in an internment camp on an island uh, after the fall of Singapore and they did hard labor and um, many of them survive. And these are the sorts of stories you don't often hear. Um, so this is just a fantastic women's history book giving you an overview of all the roles that were played by women, spies, journalists, and more in World War II. Next up, um, I started to go, or keep going rather, with um, sort of a fashion direction, and I decided to um, get a few more titles in the Dean Street Press series. So um, the first of these is Clothes Pegs by Susan Scarlett. It's a lovely color. I just love this up here, this color up here, um, but the entire cover is just beautiful. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous illustration. And um, I'll just read you the back flap here. Annabelle Brown has taken a job in the sewing room at Bertna's, a high-end dressmaker, to help her family's finances. And so when one of the models who works downstairs um, quits unexpectedly, the shop's owner decides to try lovely Annabelle in her place to the chagrin of her catty fellow models. So um, this is kind of a... Um, um, a fun sounding book. Uh, she draws the ire of the dreadful Honorable Octavia Glay and the eye of wealthy Lord David Lebet. So um, it sounds fun and um, this came out in I believe 19, yep, 1939. And so um, I have not read any Susan Scarlet yet. I'm really looking forward to it and um, it just sounds like a fun book to read in this um, early war time period, um, total other end of the spectrum from women who are prisoners of war and so forth, but I'm getting sort of a bird's eye view of the, the whole thing um, from the light to the very dark. Um, this sounds like a lot of fun, so um, I'm going to read that. And then I also got Babacombs by Susan Scarlett. I've heard some fabulous things about this book. Look at this cover. 
Um, again, this is the department store. This is about a girl called Beth. She's just out of school and beginning her first job at Babacombe's department store. And I believe it's a bit of a romance as well. Um, and that's uh, David Babacombe, the ne'er-do-well son of the store's wealthy owner. I don't know if that's who she eventually has the romance with, but we'll see. So um, that's two titles from Dean Street Press. Um, both dealing with sort of um, fashion and dressmaking and the 30s and 40s and department stores. And um, so I'm looking forward to both of these titles. And of course, Susan Scarlett is Noel Streetfield, who wrote so many wonderful children's books as well. And in addition to that, going along with the sort of department store theme, um, finally, I'm looking at a book called Service and Style, How the American Department Store Fashioned the Middle Class. And I'll try to hold this up so that you can see it. Um, and this is just a really fun uh, sort of coffee table book that talks about the history of department stores, particularly in the United States. And, um, you know, so it, it talks about how they sort of went from giant, um, almost palaces, uh, you know, that um, were very controversial when they first started and also a bit discriminatory towards some races and classes. Um, and how they sort of evolved over time, the bargain basements, um, how they uh, started to sell children's toys, how they opened up um, uh, cafes inside, um, the goods and services that they offered, the dresses, the coats, the window boxes, um, when they started to have little trolleys for children and sort of winter wonderlands inside. I remember downtown at um, our Midtown Mall, um, you know, there's there was the monorail train leading up to the North Pole so that you could go visit with Santa and sit on his lap and tell him what you wanted. And um, we have McCurdy's and Foreman's and Sibley's. Um, and a bunch of others and, you know, the development of escalators and uh, famous people making appearances at the department store and how fashionable it was to eat at the lunch uh, counters there and also how discriminatory it was with um, uh, African Americans not being able to eat at the lunch counter and how um, department stores slowly um, uh, met with the times long overdue and integrated those lunch counters and it talks about fashion um, so really a fascinating social history that sort of ties in with this department store and 1940s theme I'm kind of going with in the interwar period so um, and how uh, women are depicted and how their roles change too of course so yeah, that's all the books I have. Um, and I'm really hoping that some of you will want to uh, join in with Cinemarch. I did tag a bunch of people. Even if I did not tag you, please consider yourself tagged and please do join in. It's a whole month long uh, challenge and all you really need to do is read one book or watch one movie. And I figured in March, it's the Academy Awards, most people will be watching at least one movie. So um, it's really not a tough challenge whatsoever. It's just meant to be fun and I hope you'll join in. And that's it for today. I hope you'll get outside, see the day. We'll see you again real soon. Bye bye.